So we've learned that cycling can really support our, our well-being, uh, but it's not just individual. It can also foster connection and community, and we are so lucky to work with some amazing and passionate individuals to help that are here to share their stories and how they use cycling to create connection, increase access, and share the importance of health and wellness with youth. So here to moderate today's session, today's Outride Ambassador panel, is Tasha uh, Tina, <laughs> sorry Tasha, Tasha Tina Harrow. Uh, Tasha has spent the last decade as an advocate in the cycling industry, empowering the next generation of cyclists through her work as a coach, as an advocate, and as a mechanic. She's traveled the world as a fixed gear racer and has worked as a bike messenger in San Francisco. A voice and an advocate for all, we are thrilled that Tasha has recently joined the Outride team, overseeing our marketing, communications, and ambassador program, and wearing more hats than we can possibly count. She's an incredible force, and we're lucky to have her. So take it away, Tasha. And with that, we'd also like to welcome all the ambassadors to the stage. Uh, while our ambassadors are getting situated. Thank you, Esther, for that incredible intro. Um, as Esther said, I am a long believer in the bike as a tool for empowerment and community engagement. Fun fact, I myself have ADHD and struggled with it immensely in my youth um, and was labeled what they called back then an at-risk youth. I was fortunate enough to, at the peak of fixie fame, find that in 2008. And once I started pedaling, I never stopped. The rest is history. I went on to be a bike messenger, race in Japan, and also was the founder of a history-making app linking local, cycle, local couriers in San Francisco to uh, local businesses in San Francisco, supporting getting food to our at-risk community members during the COVID-19 pandemic. From racing to being a courier to having this now be my career, cycling has shaped my relationships and my future. The people next to me can speak to the transforming properties of cycling from focus to community to empowering the next generation. Sitting to my left, we have over, I'm gonna brag about them for a moment, 12 multiple national championships, countless actually. We tried this morning, we couldn't even get to there with everyone here. 12 world championships, two Olympians, a Paralympian, and the person telling all of their stories. I would like to welcome you, your 2020 Outright Ambassador Panel. I will, uh, most of them need no introduction, but if you all want to go, flip your mics on, and we'll start with Mr. Christopher Blevins from S Racing. Well, it's great to be here, um, and thank you, Tasha, and thank you, Specialized and Outride, and um, the whole team. My sister used to work here as the research manager, so um, Outride's a special organization, and I'm just uh, proud to be a part of it. Um, I race for uh, Specialized. I race for Specialize's uh, World Cup cross country team alongside Haley. Um, and I've been on Specialize since I was 15, so about eight or nine years now. Um, so I get to travel the world um, racing my bike, which is a dream job for me. Uh, I grew up in Durango, Colorado, and you know I could speak about the opportunities and really based around community there for um, four hours or you know, more, but I won't do that here. Uh, but you could really look 360 degrees around you on, on where a bike could take you, and I'm really passionate about um, helping to provide those opportunities for other kids. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Haley Batten. I'm also a professional cross-country mountain bike, bike racer, and um, I'm a student, and I also just simply try to live my life as fully as possible um, in my studies. And I think what draws me to be so passionate about Outride alongside everybody here and everybody tuning in um, is that I'm interested, I guess my, my studies focus on exploring the question, how can education be optimized to inspire? And I'm really interested in engaging young minds to um, be inspired about their own bodies, their own minds, and engaging with the world around them. And I think what Outride is exploring is so fascinating in that way and empi empowering people um, to engage in the world. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited to be here with Outride. It's an honor to stand al and sit along these, alongside these people, and um, I, I think we'll, we'll all benefit from hearing all the stories. 
yeah, it's pretty humbling to sit on this panel. Um, my name is Dr. Meg Fisher. I live in Missoula, Montana. It's a privilege to be right here in California and for all of you guys out there in the internet. Um, it's lovely here. You really should be here. Um, so I, my practice is, uh, well, I work as a professional paracyclist. I ride on gravel and mountain biking, and previously I raced for Team USA for 10 years where I earned 11 world championships. I was um, told I would never be here, actually. Um, 20 years ago, I was in a car accident that rolled eight and a half times, and it left me in a coma where I needed brain surgery, and um, I had my left leg ripped off. Lots of other injuries um, as well. And when I woke up, they told my parents and told me to keep expectations low. And when I came out of my coma, um, people continued to try to tell me to keep my expectations low. I, I was 19 at the time, and I was in college. They didn't think I'd go back to college. They didn't really think what I could be capable of. And um, along those lines, I was told I'd never walk again. I think I said that. But um, I found the bike. And often when I can't walk, I can bike. And the bike is... Yes, that's the physical aspect, that it is a, it's a, a tool that enables us all to explore physical abilities. But as well as, um, as you saw in the previous slides, like how it lights up your brain and how it can help you heal and help, how it can help give you direction. And I went on after you know, being rather comatose um, to earn my doctorate and graduate with honors and have the opportunity to work with people who are waking up from their comas or who are having their, uh, waking up after strokes um, and helping them explore and redefine their abilities. I'm really grateful to Outride for their support of a film called High Road that is making its tour right now and it uh, tells the story of a young athlete who lost his leg to cancer and again people try to help keep his expectations low and we've been able to work together and Jack is Jack's a star, and he is uh, overcoming and rising above all the challenges in his life, and it's been a privilege to grow paracycling categories for people just like Jack. Hi, I'm Josie Fouts, and I think I have the least amount of cycling experience up here, so I'm super hum humbled to be here. Um, I am a researcher by trade. Uh, I opened up a lab at UC San Diego, and at the same time, I was commuting 14 miles one way, and then it turned quickly into uh, 14 miles there and back, and then I was overworking, and I actually found out that riding my bike was the favorite part of my day. And so with the efforts of Esther and the San Diego cycling community, I totally just quit my job and dove like feet first into paracycling, and I learned exactly what uh, we are all here to learn, is that I enjoy riding my bike outside in nature. So now I am trailblazing to single-handedly uh, save the world with mountain paracycling. Hi, I'm Christopher Strickland. Um, I am a cyclist and professional photographer. Um, I probably started cycling about a decade ago uh, and I spent a, my first several years racing and realized, even though I have a competitive background in, in college and other sports, uh, I realized that being competitive in cycling wasn't really for me. And so through having like a little bit of like a rut, um, I'm riding again, but really I like telling stories about things that are outside of the compet competitive space, even though I do work for a professional women's team, uh, but I like to tell stories about the bike that don't have to do with being you know, a top level athlete, just more or less just enjoying the sport or other stories that are on the periphery of racing. Amazing, thank you all so much. I mean, what a powerhouse of a team right there, y'all. That's really truly speaks to the power of Outride. One of our mottos at Outride is together, we can outride anything. And when I look at this group of people, I think that's a clear as day. So on that note, we're gonna ask these lovely folks some questions since we have the honor of having them up here. Mr. Christopher Blevins, you have been an athlete, a professional athlete since your adolescence. Can you speak to how you have balanced that while with school and your own mental health? Yeah, well, um, it's, it's kind of funny when I think about being a BMX kid at age six um, to 16, but especially the elementary school years, it really felt like a professional career. I was traveling around the nation like, you know, twice a month um, to race national BMX races. And 
so I really had practice from an early age on juggling school and, and cycling. And um, you know, I can say the amount of connection that the bike brought me both to um, communities, um, whether it was my own in Durango or other places, um, to other people and then, and then to myself, I think that's really became foundational for me um, at an early age. And I think it's the, the greatest gift I've had in my life. Um, and then got into mountain biking and, and road racing and um, was always, you know, balancing school. I ended up at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo. Um, and Cal Poly is not a cycling school particularly. There's some great riders there. But it was on me to really balance racing and, and school together. Um, and, you know, I hadn't thought too much just about how the four hours outside of the classroom was benefiting me in the classroom, but I, I, I can say with confidence that it did. Um, but it just, you know, the bike, like I said, became a foundational um, grounding and connecting tool for my whole life. Um, and yeah, a real opportunity um, enabler. Amazing, thank you, Christopher. Haley, you are focusing your education on education. You are also a professional cyclist like Mr. Christopher Blevins. Can you speak to how you feel cycling can impact the education system? Yeah, I think also like Christopher, it's cycling was part of my life from such a young age and it just seemed kind of natural to continue with that and to balance everything. And in the end, you kind of understand that, wow, that time that I was so stressed about riding for two hours and how that was taking away from my studies was actually like fundamental time to making me able to focus and actually invest in my studies in a more effective way. And um, I think a lot of when I was questioning what I wanted to study in a university, I was asking bigger, bigger questions like, what is the core of so many issues that we have in our world right now and where does that all stem from? And I think so much of it happens to be is how we're informed about the world, how we're educated, how we learn, and in what ways that empowers us to apply ourselves to yeah, ourselves and the world around us. So when it when it com came to like what I wanted to study and explore and invest my time in outside of cycling, it was I found so much passion in just what education can do and how we can, you know, invest research in making that a really informative and effective place and enjoyable place for young people. And uh, so I think Outride, what's so amazing about what they're doing is actually applying the science and showing that the bike and physical activity is goes hand in hand with education and how we apply ourselves to our minds and our learning and our work and all these other places and in the world and our communities. And um, so I think what I found from a young age so naturally, just this joy of being outside, being in nature, investing myself, challenging myself, and learning how to invest in a passion, I was learning these life skills and I was applying that directly into my education as well. I knew how to overcome challenges, invest in what I was doing, find the things that engaged me and interested me and allowed myself to, to take everything to another level and have drive. And so I think all of these challenges that we, we learn from the bike and how to explore and adapt and overcome um, and also just be, you know, have joy and explore and be in the natural world. I think these are all these lessons that we learn without really realizing it and by being able to apply that to the education system. Um, I think they, they just go more hand in hand than I think um, we realize uh, at first glance. So I'm excited to be part of Outride. It's, I'm definitely gonna nerd out this whole, all day today. It's gonna be really cool, so thank you. Thank you so much, Haley. That's one of the most impressive things I feel about this panel is they all just touch cycling in so many different ways and youth spaces as well. Um, on that note, Christopher Strickland, um, you have told the stories of diversifying cycling from the athletic perspective, but I have personally heard you speak a lot to cycling in the industry as a career pathway for young people. Can you speak about what work you think we need to do about diversifying cycling, not only as a sport, but as a career pathway? Yeah, I think, I think it, it's, a, it's obviously a loaded question, but I, I think it's probably an easier challenge than it, we make it out to be, right? Like, Absolutely. I mean, people need opportunities and jobs and careers and all that thing. And I think 
sometimes we get we get used to being in certain environments and it looking a certain way and we kind of just conform to that and honestly it's really just about breaking that mold um just to share like a very 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 brief story uh we executed a shoot a global shoot uh branding shoot um and the the directors on the shoot were like wow this is so incredible like this is like this is amazing and i was like what are you what are you talking about because we're just doing the thing that you're probably used to seeing they're like but it's so diverse and i was like to be honest, I didn't even think about the cast. I We just pick people that we see every day, and it just so happened to be what it was. And not to call anybody out, but we don't need to make the cast like all white guys or all like you know all women or all men or whatever. It's just, let's just pick different people because that's the way we live our lives, right? We don't live our lives around one type of person. You find ourselves in spaces where it gets a little more narrow. So I think it's really just like kind of being observant of your environment and making sure that you're being very intentional about who you see, right? Like if, if you see that you're in a space of all men, like let's switch it up, right? Like, or if you see you're, you're in a space of even all women. I mean, it's great when you have like all women, you know, like whatever spaces, but depending on what you're doing, you should, you should make sure that there's different perspectives being, you know, allowed. And, um, and so that's, that's why I think it's super important to just, again, be, I think cycling, the cycling spaces just need to be a little bit more aware of the spaces that they're creating. And yeah. Absolutely, thank you, Christopher. And cycling industry, you're watching, you've been asking how to increase DEI. Uh, we just did research for you, there's your answer. So, Josie Fouts. Um, Josie, you've done a lot of work in increasing paracycling in the mountain biking space, but you, obviously, we were all youth at one point. What recommendations would you give to schools and educators on how to increase paracycling access to young people? Uh, that's a great question. I think if you look at us, not necessarily as separate people than everyone else, but you look at us as people, who just have different needs, uh, for example, another group is kids, then I think that really is the lens to overcome any type of adversity. Um, I think for me personally, like growing up without a hand, I was breaking that mold that Christopher was talking about, like without even knowing it. So I've lived my whole life advocating for that space without even trying. And so now I think that we have this like focused effort to make sure that not just kids, but every type of body gets onto a bicycle because you will learn as a paracyclist or going to paracycling events that it is easier to ride a bike than it is to walk. And for a lot of people that means mobility, that is freedom and when you add the aspect of like being on rugged terrain, like that right there proves that cycling is more accessible than driving. And I think that is the answer to a lot of our problems that create discrimination against paracyclists, against people with color of color and children. And I think really if we focus on overcoming each barrier or rock that we face, along life's road. And I'll let you know that road is not straightforward and painted with a pretty line. Like it is up and down and it's turning and everything. And it's like not about pointing out every crack in the road, but it's about pick and choosing the battles and what you do once you fight for. And I really believe like that right there, the more I ride on rugged terrain, the more I train myself and my brain to advocate for our space. And I, like everything that everyone is saying here is like sent chills up my spine, which is part of my nervous system. And it's amazing. Like, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Like, uh, sorry, did I answer the question? <laughs> you absolutely answered the question beautifully. Okay, yeah, 100%. Um, and I'm gonna follow up with Dr. Meg Fisher. Meg, um, I've had the absolute privilege of getting to work with Meg on the film High Road, as she mentioned, that was um, co-branded with Outride. And with this project, I got to meet this incredible young man named Jack Berry, who is 
a, you know, a cancer survivor, a cyclist, a skier, and ultimately just truly embodies the next generation of cycling. Meg, through this mentorship with Jack Berry, who you've known since he was just a little tiny tater tot, um, you knew him before he had cancer. You've known him through this entire process. What impact have you seen with cycling directly on this young person's life? It's so easy to talk about Jack. Um, I can't say enough, like watch the film, um, come to Missoula, we'll go to the arcade, we'll play games, we'll go play bikes. He's a good human and he kind of exemplifies uh, all the good things. And I don't want to burden him with all of his goodness because he is 15 and he's a, he's 15. Okay. Um, uh, so I knew Jack since the beginning and he has always been a competitive athlete. He was passionate about hockey and some of his classmates now are actually so passionate and good at hockey that they're going to hockey based high schools out of state and private schools and um, all of his classmates were, uh, were again in Missoula, Montana so everyone's going downhill very fast whether it's on skis or bikes and um, his life had a very quick break in it, very abrupt. Um, he was at summer camp and he picked up his backpack and his femur broke. It, can't, it was just like that, that he, he, cancer entered his life and changed it. So his hockey stopped, his skiing stopped, his classmates continued on and his life stopped for a period and it had to restart it really. And I can relate to that because I was in a car accident, like it was going and then stops and you're faced with these, you know, branches of a tree, like which one are you gonna take? And um, cycling for him, even when he was still in the hospital, they, there are adaptive bikes that he could pedal with his hands. There's bikes that he could pedal with one foot. And he knew me, um, again, from the beginning. And honestly, I have to say, the first thing Jack and I ever did together after we finished PT is play tennis. So my background is as a collegiate tennis player. And um, Jack wanted to play on this high school tennis team. And so he practiced so hard, he made varsity. And then he kind of wasn't cleared for mountain biking just yet. Um, and we got to do together his first bike race ever and cycling for him or actually com competition at baseline it's like all of us like to have something on the calendar whether it's a vacation to look forward to some people like a 5k some people like a turkey trot some people like um, big long bike races and bike racing seems to really fit his his niche because it's something he can he can do it's allows him to really push himself and explore what he is capable of and he's joined nika so he did every nika race He's back, he's made his new, his new team of people. He's back um, in high school. He's, he's really cool. He's so cool. <laughs> I took him to a party and like he totally ditched me. And he was like, I, anyway. Can't um, confirm was at that party, did get ditched by a Yeah, I did. Year old. I got Jack, yeah, Jack dumped me. Um, he's amazing. And knowing that there are kids like Jack and he's so representative of the, that next generation, it's really easy to advocate for and push for those next opportunities. And I'm gonna follow up that question and make you talk just a little bit more, Dr. Fisher. You have done incredible work in adding paracycling categories to bike racing. Uh, if you are someone that has looked at the roundup of lifetime events and you've noticed that suddenly there are paracycling categories, you have Dr. Fisher to thank for that. Meg? What do these race organizers and industry leaders need to do to increase paracycling access? What is your ask of them? Well, we all know how empowering the bike is. We all have stories about how, what it means to us. Um, a study last year came out from the World Health Organization that 15% of the world's population lives with a permanent physical impairment. It's a lot. Um, and I think if we think about race organizers or brands or companies, you can also think of that as a market. Right? And so increasing opportunities, and sometimes it is like, do, do you have, like, if you build it, will they come type of thing? Like, or uh, what's the order of operations? I mean, we'll have race organizers say, well, we have to have this many athletes before we'll make a category, or do we make the category and then bring athletes? And so the, it's the chicken or the egg. And I think it is, a, a, it, there's not a, a, a right answer or the most rightest answer, whatever English term you want to use, the most goodest? I don't know. Um, I often like to think that 
build it and then people like Josie and I, we will find people to fill it because they're, they're there. And as soon as you have that first person that like representation matters, they go, oh yeah, my cousin or the, my, my neighbor's cousin's colleague uses a wheelchair for their mobility device. Oh, oh, there's actually organizations that provide hand cycles? Great, because cycling is a challenging sport to get into because you might helmet, bike, shoes, water, nutrition. You can think of, you can make as many obstacles to getting into the sport as you want. However, I mean, any bike is a gravel bike. Any bike kind of is a mountain bike. I mean, some of these are more comfortable than others um, and better <laughs> suited to the task. So I, when I think about race organizers, I think uh, like reaching out to um, athletes or organizations, and I'm certainly uh, eager to help facilitate that conversation. And I also think um, there are people passionate about parasport across across the world, and it's just a matter of changing your perspective a little bit and seeing that 15% of the world's population that often gets kind of hidden in the shadows. Absolutely, Josie, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, I just have a question for Meg. So, to physically add a paracycling category to an already sanctioned race, how much time does that take? So it kind of depends on what sanctions. Is it sanctioned by UCI, USAC, or is it a... Oh, uh, let's just say, for example, Rebecca is private Idaho. Like, not really UCI sanctioned, but, like, very community-based. So that was a conversation that took me about a year and a half to two years to get done. Um, and the actual back-end work for organizations like Bike Monkey or um, a lot of kind of the online aspects for registration, um, it's... I'll, use, I'll say relatively easy. It's not a, a huge ask. Um, it often more is like helping people understand what it means to be a paracyclist um, and helping people recognize that it's not, it's not as hard as they think it is. Absolutely, and that circles back to together, we can outwrite anything, and these two are making sure that happens, so thank you both. Um, to the audience out there, both physically as well as in the on the internet. Um, if you have a question in the audience in person, please throw your hand up. Chaz will run a mic to you. Audience online, we have questions coming in now. Feel free to start submitting them and we're gonna be asking those of our panel up here from the rest of the time we have. Christopher Blevins, this one's for you. This is from Greg. How did mentors or other writers play a role early in your cycling career as a child? Yeah, it was um, it was a proper army of mentors and coaches I had, um, which I'm incredibly grateful for. Um, the BMX coaches were funny. Um, BMX is a unique discipline, and I had some coaches that I, I do sprints from age six, like up a climb until I throw up, and then they throw cones at me on the on the turns. I wouldn't say that's a you know good approach. So don't throw cones at kids. <laughs> Um, but it kind of worked in some ways. Um, and then I had some amazing coaches in Durango on the mountain bike who really taught me how, you know, we say exploration a lot, but that means so much. Um, you know, the, you're exploring the physical surroundings, but you're really exploring yourself. And uh, the Durango Devo model growing up was never forget the feeling. And that just sort of kind of became etched in my philosophy. And, um, you know, you, you don't want to forget the, 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 the pure feeling of riding your bike and especially with people. Um, we all know that that's magic. So, um, you know, I had tons of coaches who taught me the, the bike riding skills that, that took me on the trajectory to being a pro. But most importantly, it was, um, you know, community-based and fun-based. Um, Durango's unique in, in the way that it sort of accidentally produced a lot of world champions, Olympians, and Tour de France stage winners. And um, we were all riding together as kids, just, you know, just messing around and accidentally going fast at the same time. So I think that's the best approach. And the, and the best coaches and mentors are really just shepherding kids to find that themselves. That's amazing, Christopher. And for those of you that don't know something that is extra special about that story, Durango Devo is one of the original outright fund grantees. Durango also serves two Riding for Focus schools, 
And Outride just recently visited Mountain Bike Specialist, which is a specialized retailer who have one of uh, Christopher's jerseys hanging up on the wall. And they, for the last two years, have served um, all of the riding for Focus Bikes for both of these schools. So if you want to talk about a community that is amplifying the next generation of cycling as well as supporting Outride, um, Durango is it. So thank you, Christopher. So we have this coming in from Bjorn Cavanaugh on Hoova. And I'm going to ask the question. If you guys could put a finger up, I will grab one of you to answer it, OK? How do we use this information to engage and connect with community members and youth leaders in order to implement better cycling? Dr. Fisher. There's a really easy saying. Movement is medicine. And I think if the more we repeat that, and it just kind of like, oh, yeah, that feels really good. Like, it's catchy, you know? And um, if we remind, remind ourselves, like, the, all the research we learned is, like, just getting people moving. And I think anybody who works a 40-hour week, especially the way our work culture is, we kind of think, oh, yeah, I want to be moving. And we think about, oh, yeah, let's, it's medicine. We need to be moving. I think that's an easy way to bring that to a community. And they kind of, kind of all start nodding their heads and hopefully in unison. And then people get moving. Josie, and thank you, Meg. I would like to add to that, just like with the mindset of focusing on the things we can do today, not what we should have done in the past, not what we're supposed to do in the future, and not what we can't do, because that list is going to be much longer than the things we can do. But you know, there's this balance of quality over quantity. So it's not really about the things that we can't do. It's about the things we can do and the people who can ride and who can inspire other people to ride and I think like uh, we're all here to prove but like when we focus on the abilities that we do have together we can outride anything absolutely Christopher Strickland just to add um I was photographing uh, somebody who is in the fixie space, and he ha he hosts like a, a Tuesday night situation, if you will. Um, and I it, it's it's been going, I think, for about a year and a half, or maybe even close to two years. And I just asked him, I was like, "Oh, how did you do this?" And he was like, "Oh, like me and my friends just started meeting up." And I don't know if this directly answers the question, but it's just something that I think is like anecdotally really cool. Um, and it's turned into like this big thing. It's Tuesday night track bikes, meet up, play games. Like they're not doing bike stuff. You know what I mean? They're, they are meeting because they are cyclists and that's how they get to the point. But at the end of the day, they're just going there to do something very fun and simple. And I think, I think when we like address that question, sometimes we're being a little too complicated and we're trying to be a little too grandiose. And sometimes you can just start simple. You can build it up from there, you know, but like find that community and the people who want to participate with you um, and, and then share ideas and then build your, build something from there. Absolutely. Thank you, Christopher. And I believe I know this has happened to take place at the island in San Francisco. If you want to look at a testament to if you build it, they will come. This is an event that was started by a local young person in the fixie scene that I am also a part of. Um, it is that simple. And when Christopher says people come out, we're talking upwards of sometimes 50 to 100 people at this event on a random Tuesday night coming out and playing bikes. And I think it is important for us all to remember, no matter what stage of the life cycle we are in, while we are building this infrastructure for youth, um, ultimately the bike brings us all back to that. And that's why it can be such a powerful tool for this. So next question is going to be from Nick from People for Bikes um, and jumps off of this. If you are in the fixed gear space, you will have friends in that. If you live in Durango, Colorado, and you're part of these outride programs, you will have folks introducing you to cycling with a lot of energy behind it. However, not everyone comes from a more cycling-centric world, right? And I will just have you all throw up a hand for this one once again. How do we talk to kids and caregivers who might be afraid of the bike? Yes, Christopher Levins. Yeah, I think, you know, the entry point to all of these things can be more challenging for some people than, you know, a kid growing up in Durango. So um, making the bike relatable to to anyone, um, and, and we're, when we're talking in the context of kids, making it um, approachable and fun. And um, the best thing about the bike is it can be simple. It can be, it can take you, um, you know, from, from a parking lot ride to a crazy trail um, or a hundred mile ride. And 
I think that, you know, Outride and Riding for Focus really gives those entry points um, a place and a context. Um, I think that the structures, the different, like if you look from a 30,000 foot landscape of kind of youth engagement and, and youth programming, um, when it comes to the bike, there's so many different great programs and functions and um, there's sort of a constellation and the, the, the organizations and the people that are connecting the dots and building kind of more of a ecosystem through the bike. Um, ben, the kid who find something on a parking lot ride can then progress into um, more challenging and more fun um, situations. So, I mean, in short, I, I would say that the approachability and the ease and the simplicity of riding your bike has to be front and center um, in that initial starting point. Absolutely, Haley. Yeah, I just wanna add, I had the opportunity to go to Copenhagen this year, and I think that city is so bike friendly where it's com like we they are able to commute everywhere there by bike. And I think that's such a great place to start is that the bike in its simplest form can just be used to commute to school, to commute to work. And I think it doesn't have to be, you know, the Tour de France or the Red Bull Rampage right away. And it's funny that's when, when people ask, oh, you're a cyclist. Like, do you do the Red Bull Rampage or the Tour de France? No, like you could, you could be a cyclist and just be commuting to work every day. And I think, um, of course, I mean, making walkable and rideable cities is a whole whole nother process, but it can really start there. And I think also with making it accessible is sometimes, or I don't know if accessible is the right word, but to making it not as scary is maybe sometimes the, the challenge of it, we can also communicate that part as being part of the growth. And by seeing that, okay, maybe cycling is challenging at first, but those challenges are what allows a lot of personal growth to take place and a lot of introspection and exploration. And I think seeing it as a challenge is sometimes a good thing. And it might take time to communicate and tell that story, but um, if we just start riding our bikes to work or to school, maybe that's a good place to start. And communicating those challenges is actually the most beautiful part about this sport. Um, so even though it's scary, I think those the perception of what's scary will change with time and just, yeah, starting with riding to school or something like that. Beautiful. I think that's... An excellent answer, you know, creating access points that we don't all have to go, you know, ride down the wall and Nicene immediately, right? We can, uh, we can start with a simple ride down the road to school. Josie? I just wanted to add to the point, like when I started seriously cycling, I was very serious. I was like, I'm gonna go to the Paralympics, like top notch. So I missed this phase of having fun on the bike. And I think that's the key because if we're here in a capitalist world and we're marketing to the masses of people, we should be marketing having fun because most people just want to ride for fun. And even the people who think that fast is fun, there's first a fun phase, a slow, and then afterwards, there's still another fun phase. So if we want to get more people on bikes, we have to make it fun. Absolutely. Christopher Strickland. And I'm just going to play piggyback for this whole panel. Um, but yeah, I think there's like a couple of funny memes that I've seen over the, like the years. It's like, just because you drive a car doesn't mean you're going to be an F1 racer, right? Just because you go to the gym doesn't mean you're all of a sudden going to become this bodybuilder, right? Those are things that require a lot more time and dedication. Getting on the bike is pretty simple, you know, for the most part. Um, and so just taking a step back again and realizing like, what is this thing actually for, right? You can, you can make it what you want, but at the end of the day, if you're getting on it to Haley's point, you, you've done it. You've already done it by just getting on the bike. So as long as we're using communication that allows people to realize that it's not, you know, when, so, when you tell somebody, when at least Haley and Chris tell somebody like, oh, I race bikes, they're like, oh, like Tour de France, you know? Even in and, of, in and of itself, there's more options than that, right? So just as long as we're like communicating that there's like a whole world of bikes, not just this one path of bikes, I think it's easier to like allow the youth to understand that like, yeah, you can do a bunch of cool things on bikes besides just race. Even though racing is very cool, I think racing is very cool too, but there's just a lot of other options out there. Absolutely, and it's, it's funny you say that too about the Tour de France, because I think even when people hear you race bikes, that's automatically what Thinking, despite 12 world championships up here, have any of us raced the Tour de France? Exactly. So um, this will be our final question. And I'm going to ask that before you all answer it, I want you to close your eyes and think about it for a good 30 seconds, OK? It's a very powerful one. That's why I've saved it for the end. 
if you had a magic wand that would grant solution to an issue that needs to be addressed in the cycling industry, what is the issue and what is your best solution? We're going to take a little bit of time first to think about it. Audience, this would be an opportune time for you to think about this as well as a problem that you can address in our community moving forward and how you can find solution. Josie, I'm going to open with you. Thank you. Okay, so I'll just let you know that I was thinking, I do have a magic wand, and <laughs> or my stub, um, and I think, again, we live in a capitalist world, so we need to cater to the masses. And a lot of people, when they see me, they see the parts that I don't have. I'm missing a left hand. But the things that they don't realize is like me being a, an Asian American woman who's 5'2", it is very difficult to find small bikes and that like work with my body or I can get a full dropper post on. And I think if we can look at us objectively Every tall person is a short person at some point in their life. And every short person is short their whole life. So again, if we're going to cater to the masses, like let's make bikes accessible to people who are short. And then maybe we will see those numbers in participation in events and races for kids and women to increase. So that's where, that's where my brain goes. It's like, let's optimize bikes for people, for the rider not for the industry. Absolutely, well, as the shortest member of the Outride team by about four inches, you have my support on that, of course. Um, to the rest of our panel, would anyone else like to answer that question? Christopher Strickland. Yeah, um, I think uh, the thing that stands out most with me is just making the space more inclusive. And I know that's like very cliche and it, it's it's almost tiring because it's not, it's, again, it shouldn't be a task, right? Like it, it's, there's a lot of barriers in the sport and in the, especially in the competitive side of the sport. And I think it's just a little bit ridiculous, you know? So I, at the end of the day, just, I think if you're trying to create, if it's if it's becoming a challenge to kind of create things that mitigate your space or whatever that you're probably trying too hard you know like let's just like make the space open like i love body positivity you know like i love seeing more trans athletes out there i love seeing you know para athletes these are things that i wasn't necessarily like super familiar with as coming into like ball sports you know as i was coming up you know those are those, i don't even know how much of a conversation those are right now but in cycling at least you know it is a conversation and i think you know we should just open the gates and just let everybody participate in the way they want to instead of saying like, no, you can only do it this way or you can only do it that way. Or if you're this, you got to do it over here. And if you're that, you got to do it over there. No, let, let, let's just roll. Like, you know, like it's, there's a lot, there's too much thinking and I don't know, I'm a little bit lazy when it comes to that much level of thinking, you know, like let's just let people play, you know? Absolutely. Um, and on that note, we are going to be closing out our panel. Audience, you will have 15 minutes to rest until 930 to take a break. And I just would like to thank every person sitting up here. Um, what an honor it is to stand next to these, this crew. They have, they're truly changing the landscape. They have already changed lives. They've won countless medals, but I think above all that, um, they are proof that together we can't outride anything. So thank you all so much. <laughs>